Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Linnea Lucan, Research Fellow with the Heartland Institute's Arthur B. Robinson Center on Climate and Environmental Policy. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Petroleum Engineering, a minor in Geology, and before coming to Heartland, I worked offshore in the oil industry on deepwater drill ships in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm trying out a new video series here with the Heartland Institute where I discuss different energy sources and try to address some of the common misconceptions about them. This week, we're covering the oil and gas industry, which has been in the news a lot recently, and so many people are pushing false narratives. This is as good a time as any to work through some of those. That being said, let's get into it, starting with a quick overview of the uses for oil and gas. When it comes to natural gas and oil, everyone already knows that you use it to heat your home, generate electricity at power plants, and fuel planes, trains, and automobiles. There are at least 6,000 products that are made from oil and gas, such as computers or the cell phone that you might be watching this on. Maybe most critically today, given rising food prices, petroleum processing byproducts and natural gas go into making fertilizers and pesticides for agriculture. And then single-use plastics that are essential for sterile medical use are another important product. There are also a huge number of essential chemicals derived from oil, most of all benzene, uh, that are used in medicines like aspirin. Almost every pill you take will have at least some of these chemicals. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history because I think it's cool. And lacking the amount of time that I would need to really go over it in detail, I'm gonna skip over most of the earliest history, though it's really neat, and I suggest that you look into it if you want. There are several websites that I'll post here on the screen while I talk that you can go and look up some of this history. Um, it's really neat and I highly recommend you look into it. So throughout history, multiple ancient civilizations used pitch, tar, and asphalt as building and weatherproofing material for boats, um, as well as burning it for lighting. The first early wells I know of were drilled in China in 347 AD using bamboo poles. Jumping way forward, and again, skipping a bunch of the cool stuff, the first commercial oil production business and refinery was started for lamp oil and lubricating paraffin oil in the 1850s in Scotland. The first true modern oil well was drilled around the same time in Pennsylvania, and it was drilled using a steam engine. The first offshore well produced oil in 1897 in California. Those earliest offshore wells, which we're showing on the screen here, were only a few hundred feet out and were drilled off of piers. In 1911, a well in a Louisiana lake was drilled without any pier, becoming the first true offshore well in water that was probably only about 10 feet deep or less, which is crazy to talk about considering my history in the industry. Today, offshore wells are often drilled in 10,000 feet of water or more. The first hydraulically fractured gas well, that is, a well fractured with fluid pressure, was fracked in 1947 in Kansas, but the real boom didn't occur until this technology was used in conjunction with horizontal drilling. And since the early 2000s, it's become an extremely useful way of getting natural gas and gas condensates and oil from tight shale formations. Now that I've given you a little bit of background, I'd like to get more into policy and general musings about recent news. So given the current situation with Ukraine and Russia, oil prices are in the news a lot recently. And I want to help others see through some of the false or mistaken narratives that are being pushed in the media and on places like TikTok, which, you know, these TikTokers were briefed by the White House on what to say. And as expected, it's pretty biased and a lot of the information is misleading. One such narrative is the idea that because something like the Keystone XL, for example, might not have been finished by now, had the Biden administration not canceled it, current oil prices do not reflect Biden policy. This is totally misleading. Oil prices are not based solely on current output and current demand. Oil futures, future being the key word here, change by the hour and can fluctuate wildly based on supply that's expected to change because of world events and policies. It's not all about how, we're, how much oil we are currently producing or how long it will take a certain policy to come into effect. The mere suggestion of a policy that might influence the supply or demand of oil is enough to change the price. Anticipation of a hostile presidential administration, for example, may also influence the price as oil companies try to get ready for regulation, as they did in 2020. Okay, I have one final Would question. Would he close down the oil industry? It falls. Would you close it down falls. the oil industry? By the way, industry? I have a transition from the oil industry, yes. 
Oh, I will transition. At the Heartland Institute, just before Russia invaded Ukraine, we published an analysis on energy costs that estimated the average American household spent about $1,000 more on energy in 2021 than the previous year. That 1000 includes the average household spending about $600 or more on gas prices in 2021 than in 2020. That was just before Russia invaded Ukraine. At that point, the average price of gas was around $3.44 and climbing. Now, it's around $4.34. That's almost an entire dollar in one month. When it comes to the specific policies that impacted these prices, the media is fast to blame world events, which certainly have a large effect. That's obvious. However, it would be misguided and wrong to say that anti-fossil fuel policy decisions from this administration, which are more or less heavier versions of Obama policies, do not also share significant blame. Now, today's executive order also directs the Secretary of the Interior to stop issuing new oil and gas leases on public lands and, offshore, and in offshore waters wherever possible. Many of these policies got started under Obama, but were reversed under Trump and then locked down again day one, literally day one, in an executive order by Biden. So I'm going to go over some of these in uh, some bullet points that we will have up on the screen here. Number one that is talked about a lot in conservative media and also in liberal media is canceling the Keystone XL pipeline. This one is contentious because the White House says that it wouldn't have been finished on time, uh, even if Biden hadn't canceled it. This is a bad argument. We have reason to believe that it very well could have been up and running by now. There was only a small section left to finish. It would have brought around 830,000 barrels a day from Canada safely and efficiently. And now, some of that oil is likely still getting here, but it's going to be more expensive and it's going to be by rail, which is less safe and it's more polluting. Go figure. Restricting drilling in parts of the Arctic Ocean, Bering Sea, and federal lands. Placing a moratorium on new oil and gas leases on federal land. Rescinding energy production leases in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. When Saki says that there are 9,000 unused leases and points the finger at oil companies for not developing them, she either doesn't know what she's talking about or she's lying. It's also worth mentioning that no onshore lease sales have been held since 2020 under Biden's leasing ban, and of leases that are active, 2,200 of them are being held up in court by environmental groups. Leases represent opportunities for exploration, not necessarily dedicated and proven reserves. Even once a lease is approved, development can't start until an environmental analysis is completed. There are a significant number of drilling permits awaiting for approval from the government, 4,766 of them were still pending at the end of February, in fact, and that number has been more or less climbing since June of 2021. Finding oil is an expensive and complex process that can yield surprising results even with good geologic surveys. I've personally seen planned wells that come up dry that were drilled in known productive blocks due to unforeseen downhole formation conditions. So, even though a well only a few miles away is producing just fine and has plenty of oil, the spot that we picked to drill ended up coming up with a dry hole. They've also conflated the drilling lease question with drilling permits, which are a different thing, in that you need them in addition to winning a bid on a lease. Regarding those drilling permits, oil companies are not stupid. Upon the election of Biden in 2020, Companies with federal leases in some states, like New Mexico and Wyoming, stocked up on their drilling permits for the next four years or so in anticipation of the permitting barricades that they knew that Biden would put in place. Because throughout his campaign trail, he said that he was going to end fracking, that he was going to end drilling on federal lands. Those permitted leases that they stocked up on are not necessarily ready to be drilled now. There have also been plans to close nearly half of the National Petroleum Reserve in Alaska. Stringent new regulations on methane emissions from oil and gas production. Classifying produced water from oil and gas drilling as toxic waste, or you can also call it residual water, uh, just to clarify for people who aren't familiar with the jargon of the industry. But uh, produced water is basically the fluid that comes up with the oil and gas underground. So you'll have usually a saline type of water. And uh, nowadays, the federal government wants us to classify that saline 
that comes up with the oil and gas as toxic waste. The government has also considered hiking royalties and has threatened to hike royalties paid to them by the fossil fuel companies for their product. And at the same time, they're encouraging fossil fuel divestment and encouraging the currently fashionable ESG investment policy. So basically, the government is threatening to take more money from these oil companies down the line in terms of royalties. And also, they want to encourage banks and other lenders and investors to not invest in fossil fuel-related projects. This was a bare-bones analysis and didn't really account for the fact that the price of oil also has a twofold impact on food prices. First, because of the petroleum byproducts and derivatives that go into making these nitrogen-based fertilizers in particular, the price of those fertilizers have gone up. Back in January, fertilizer was up 200% year over year and was expected to go up another 80% in 2022. That was before the current fuel situation. The second impact on food prices are more obvious in the fuel costs for tractors during the harvest and trucks for shipping and the energy costs for factories and packaging plants, and it goes on and on and on. Really, all goods are impacted by this. Our supply chain issues may well be made much worse. My proposal for energy policy regarding fossil fuels is this. Basically, for the best possible results, the best possible prices for consumers, and energy sovereignty, I think the best bet is for the Biden administration to seriously consider removing the barriers that I have discussed here. Stop tapping into the strategic reserve every time there's a jump in prices. It doesn't work anyway. Reasonable environmental protection measures are not something I'm against. In fact, the United States is the cleanest producer of oil and gas on Earth and is getting cleaner all the time. Another reason production should take place here rather than in countries with lower environmental standards, more corruption, and limited enforcement of environmental policy. I hope this has cleared up some of the misconceptions that you might have heard concerning the ongoing health of the oil and gas industry, its importance to modern economies, and to the health of everyone on the planet, really. And um, I look forward to speaking with you again on future energy topics, and maybe even going into further depth on this topic Please, if you have any questions at all, leave them in the comments section. We really appreciate getting a like, maybe subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications. You know the drill. Thank you very much. This has been Linnea Lucan with the Heartland Institute.